Hello, everyone. A warm welcome to you all uh, who have joined us in this room and also to everyone who's joined us virtually. Uh, a big thank you for attending this session, Creating Digital Public Infrastructure That Empowers People. My name is Aishwarya Salvi. I'm an advisor at the German Agency for International Cooperation, GIZ, working in the field of digital governance, and I'll be your on-site moderator today. A brief note on the housekeeping and what is it that we've planned for the session. Uh, our session is being held in a hybrid format, and it will be a roundtable discussion with an open Q&A. We highly encourage all participants to contribute to this discussion. For all participants who are joining us virtually, please keep your microphones muted during the session. You are encouraged to post questions and comments in the chat box at any point of time. My colleague, Torge Walters, will be monitoring the chat and fielding questions from there for our Q&A rounds. This session is organized by the German Federal Ministry of Digital and Transport together with GIZ. The ministry engages with digital dialogues with several key partner countries to ensure that we shape better framework conditions for digital transformations of our governments, economies, and societies. As a multi-stakeholder initiative, the Digital Dialogues provides a platform for direct exchange between policymakers, regulators, businesses, and civil society. The goal of this session is to share lessons on approaches undertaken by countries represented on this panel in the implementation of digital public infrastructure. We all know digital technologies have drastically transformed the way we interact and transact in the world. The most notable means of digital transformation has been the development of digital public infrastructure. So what do we mean by DPI? Uh, DPI are society-wide digital capabilities that are essential to participation in the society and markets as a citizen, entrepreneur, and consumer in the digital world. With the growing demand, governments are now adopting different approaches to implement DPI based on the availability of resources, engagement with the private sector, interaction with the civil society, and citizens, and also support from international organizations. In this session, we set out to understand the existing DPI ecosystem in the countries that are represented on the panel. Uh, also, we understand the steps taken by the governments to balance differing needs and interests of the stakeholders. Additionally, we will use this opportunity to exchange the lessons from the DPI implementation and discuss how international cooperation can foster the creation of inclusive, interoperable, and accountable DPI that empowers people. For this discussion, we are joined by our esteemed panel members who have contributed extensively in the field of digital transformation. First off, we have Valeria Yonan, Deputy Minister of Ministry of Digital Transformation of Ukraine, joining us from Kyiv. Valeria oversees Ukraine's national digital literacy policy, development and growth of SMEs, entrepreneurship, regional digital transformation, as well as Euro integration and international relations. Next, we have Dr. Pramod Varma joining us virtually from the US. Thank you, Pramod, for waking up so early in the morning for us. Uh, presently, he's serving as the CTO at AXTEP Foundation and co-chair at the Center for Digital Public Infrastructure. His extensive experience as a former chief architect of India's Aadhaar program and his work with India's stack layers like the eSign and Digital Locker makes him a prominent player in India's digital infrastructure. Next up in this room, we are joined by Mark Irura from Kenya. Mark is currently a technical advisor for the Fair Forward Artificial Intelligence for All project at GIZ. He possesses valuable expertise in data and digital system management. His previous background includes his role as the consultant at Open Institute and project manager at Development Getaway. He has extensive experience in implementing various digital in initiatives in Kenya. And finally, we have the dynamic Adriana Gro. She is the co-founder of Sovereign Tech Fund in Germany and former director of impactful tech projects such as the Prototype Fund at Open Knowledge Foundation. 
and she has been a prominent figure in advancing digital sovereignty, participation, as well as open digital infrastructures. A round of applause for our panel members. Thank you. But before we dive into our discussion, I would like to make a special mention here. As said earlier, the session is organized by the German Ministry of Digital and Transport, and we are joined by Ms. Irina Zufki. She's a director at the National European and International Digital Policy, and I would request her to kindly give her opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, and welcome everybody. It's wonderful that you're all here, and it's a great pleasure for me to engage today in this discussion on digital public infrastructure, a very timely topic, obviously, and I must say that uh, in particular the Indian G20 presidency did a great job in bringing this topic to the center of the stage. In the process, we learned a lot about what India has achieved in the field already, which is, which is quite impressive, and I assume we will hear a bit, about, a bit more about that also today. But obviously, there are also other countries that have already done impressive projects in the field. Um, so it's, it's great that we engage into further discussion today, talk a bit about lessons learned, um, and obviously Germany is also doing its share in the field. We don't usually call it digital public infrastructure internally. We rather talk maybe about digital public services, but probably in substance we're doing about the same thing. So we certainly do have an EID, which is uh, supposed to get smart. So on your smartphone this year, we are moving it in the direction of an EU idea, which so then be usable within the entire European Union. So these are pretty important projects. And for good reason, they are central in our national digital strategy because we believe that implementing these projects is particularly important to enable digitization across different fields and, and branches. So another example for our national work would be, and this is actually something that my ministry is doing, uh, building a, a in ecosystem of mobility data, which is, um, yeah, which we use to really make public data available, but we also fuse with data that is provided by, by private sector act players. So, and bringing the two together, we hope will have an, have an impact on making new, new business models, new options possible. But this is, just examples of what we do at home. Maybe the even more spectacular thing is what we do together with partners internationally, and that is not us, but colleagues from the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, and of course GIZ, that is a GovStack initiative, which is uh, yeah, a pretty impressive project that we also during the Indian G20 presidency talked about quite a lot. It's all about open, interoperable, elements uh, that are reusable, offering them to, to countries to use them to build their public infrastructure. As I said, with a focus on interoperability and openness, reusability, which is very, very important. So yeah, this is maybe something that we can bring to the discussion and uh, talk a bit about lessons learned there. But now I'm really excited to hear what, what others do. And I know that there are, yeah, very impressive examples that we hear about. So looking forward to, to the discussion and the debate uh, and very glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we've seen Germany has always supported uh, inclusive and interoperable digital services. And uh, the work that GovStack has done has also helped other countries uh, introduce and implement these digital services in their countries. So thank you so much. Uh, we now jump into the discussion. We have two rounds, and each round will be followed by a QA. and a We have reserved three minutes for each speaker to respond to these questions in each round. I just want to reiterate that we will be strict with the time uh, in order to allow everyone, including the audience, to participate in this discussion properly. So in the first round, we will look at the existing DPI ecosystem. Uh, we all know that creation of DPI in several countries is a result of cross-sectoral partnerships between governments laying down the digital guardrails, uh, the private sector providing the technical services, the civil society academia and citizens providing feedback to their uh, services to make them more user-centric. And each actor in this ecosystem has its own needs and interests. 
For instance, uh, IT companies need a return on investments to be incentivized to participate in the ecosystem. We have data-driven models that drive innovation, but they also raise privacy-related risks and could lead to exclusion of marginalized communities. So given this context, my question to all speakers is, what role does each actor play in your country's DPI ecosystem? And how does the government strike a balance between deferring needs and interest of these stakeholders? Uh, I would first invite Dr. Pramod Varma. Um, he's worked extensively in India and uh, would request him to respond to this question now. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, okay. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, thank you, Aishiria, for setting that up. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, uh, the, um, there are two parts to um, your question. And let me clarify a little bit of a difference in how India is looking at these ecosystems. There are uh, supply-side ecosystems. Supply-side means building DPI. To build a DPI, uh, who is supporting you? Is private sector supporting you? Is a civil society engaging with you? Uh, that's I think that's what you alluded to, Aishwarya, when you mentioned the two ecosystems are joining in. Uh, but there is also, a sig and that's been done in most of the e-governance projects in the last two decades of, you know, maybe even more. Uh, you know, especially many of the uh, countries use private sector to supplement the capacity uh, of the government and get it done. So IT, IT services and other private sector services participating in the supply side, that is towards the build of the DPI, uh, is very common. And India is no different, frankly, in that. As use of civil society or citizen engagement also as a supply side tool to improve uh, the you know, privacy elements, inclusion elements, uh, the desirability of that particular pr project uh, uh, is very, very key. Uh, and that is also essential in building up anything that is infrastructure in nature. So DPIs by definition are not full solutions and they are just infrastructure in nature. So that's key. But there's a significant difference in India's approach to DPI is also the demand side usage. That's very different. That is where you put out something like GPS as a building block, as a digital public infrastructure and private sector innovation is innovating market solutions. These are not IT services company helping you build it. It's a use of, use of DPI is where the ecosystem is very key not building of the DPI. Use of DPI, we believe, India believes, once the DPI is architected well, interoperable, minimal, I would actually put minimalism as one of the most important principles as well, interoperable, like GPS, think very minimal. All it does is very, very little. But combining and using these DPIs, market, civil society, like NGOs, and even government can build layered set of solutions, like the way solutions on the internet, that actually reaches the large population. And this is key for India because India's diversity and scale is enormous, right? 1.4 billion people, 22 official languages, but hundreds of languages, lots. It's like a continent by itself. So it's creating one solution for you or one solution for Africa, for example. It's a continent, it's a lot of people. So different culture, different society, different context. Uh, so one solution is not what we are after. One infrastructure, what is what we are after? Many, many solutions on top of the infrastructure. So think of internet, many solutions on internet. Think of GPS, many solutions combining GPS. So think of infrastructure as a means to create minimal interoperable building blocks that is left now opened up for the demand side ecosystem which is market ecosystem, civil society ecosystem, and government. Even government can innovate, can in innovation system, who creates very contextual solutions uh, to those people. And in this, market is very key because market creates sustainability and uh, creates very, very agile innovation. 
unlike government trying to do everything. So market is key for us and UPI, Unified Payment Interface, is a classic example where multi, multiple unicorns and multiple multiple large countries, like including Google Pay, plays out, but interoperability, is it's, we have mentioned uh, no monopolization or colonization of that sort, right? It is infrastructure is open and interoperable. And but NGOs are even even key for us because India's diversity necessitates a long tail. The last long tail solutioning is very hard. Uh, solutioning for the small section, for example, a very small vulnerable section in a tribal sector, is very hard because cost of developing solutions are very high, and so DPS also bring down the cost of solutioning, which is what happened with digital ID, digital payments, and digi paperless interactions, it dramatically reduces the cost of solutioning and for NGOs as well. So uh, we believe demand side ecosystem is more important for the DPI Ashwarya than the supply side ecosystem because that, that creates sustainability of solutioning and diversity of solutioning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pramod. I think in India, it's unique to see how the community got involved in this ecosystem, how the uptake was higher because uh, everyone, right, in the remotest villages were able to get a phone to access these services on just one device. So I think that's unique to India. Uh, moving next into the room, I would request Mark to give his response. Thank you. Thanks. Um, to add on to what's, what's been shared already, um, we so demand and the supply the supply and the demand side were mentioned. And on the supply side, we have actors such as funders, actors such as government, sometimes even private sector and um, civil society. They are trying to, to create something, to build something. Um, and the way it's been portrayed as well is that we have people who sit in, in the middle there still on the, almost on the demand side because they are waiting on this package. They are waiting on a payment system to leverage it to deliver a service. And then we have users, users who do not care. They do not care about digital government. They know government, so they want uh, a service. Um, so if I could speak to Kenya previously before we moved on to like uh, one e-government platform it was uh, uh, management information systems being layered across various departments. So if you wanted to register a business, you go to one office, you fill in a form, you wait a couple of days, you go back. So when they digitized or automated, you still had to go to that office and then you were sent to another office, even though they had a system. But now everything has kind of been centralized a little bit, but we are still finding a challenge because um, there is no community in between the demand and the supply to be able to innovate around packages of reusable interoperable components. So because of that, there is no longer term view about these digital services. What do they look like? If, if, if payments, if today for some reason the payment platform for government goes down, what's the impact on the economy? If today, for example, um, there's an outage for 30, 30 minutes um, that businesses cannot be registered. And so I think to add on to what's already been shared is, is the thinking that we have system integrators who sit in between. System integrators are startups, they have been mentioned, startups or even uh, tech companies who are able to, to latch on to what is already existing and build upon it. But there are some things that government or even funders, they cannot take away. So let me give an example of a responsibility government cannot delegate the regulation aspect or the vision or the foresight. What does this platform look like 10 years from now? Uh, because w whatever we are building now in two or three years will be a legacy system. So what will that look like? Who will continue to maintain it and sustain it? Who will pay for it? 
So it's, 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 if we have a community approach, then we don't just think in terms of mm, open source, in terms of open source free beer, <laughs> but it's open source around how can this developer community not resent putting in their intellect and their energy into building these services and building them over the long term. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Yes, I think uh, the concept of system integrators is very important because as you mentioned, the government needs to look at the governance and the regulations that they need to lay down. But when we talk about operational and management uh, uh, issues, we need these startups and companies to get more involved in the economy and in the ecosystem to do the daily uh, um, uh, repair work or the maintenance of these services. So thank you so much, Mark, uh, for your response. Uh, we now move to Adriana. Uh, I would invite her to share her experience, uh, what's happening in Germany, how do we balance these needs of stakeholders. Thank you. Um, so now I'm stretching the definition and uh, there well, the topic we're talking about a little bit with um, the work that we're doing with the Sovereign Tech Fund uh, in Germany, but we're not limited uh, to software that is developed in, in Germany. Um, so maybe a few words about, about this uh, so you understand how I'm stretching the definition of DPI that we're using right now. Um, the Sovereign Tech Fund uh, supports um, open digital base technologies, that's how we call them, to not use digital infrastructure again because otherwise the term just gets really bloated. Um, and what I mean by that, to uh, put it simple, is software that developers use to develop software. And we, not speaking for this room uh, maybe, but most people don't think about that, uh, although it's very necessary. This software is uh, very critical and very vulnerable, and if it breaks, it scales massively through everything that we're using every day. But it's invisible for many people who are not software developers, um, because you're just, just using the interface, but there's a lot behind that. Um, we, we've seen with Heartbleed way back, but also with Log4j, how it impacts everyone, basically, when it breaks. And the Sovereign Tech Fund's mission now is to, well, not probably won't be able to prevent it forever, but to work on it and uh, make the awareness, uh, um, increase the awareness a bit for this layer um, of the software stack. So what I mean then by um, stretching or complementing the DPI um, approaches we already heard is to, well, basically saying, look a bit deeper. Um, because everything we build relies on software that is running in the background and that community and software developers also in companies and businesses need. Um, I have some numbers, they're all very, very terrible, but I'm just going to say maybe one there, like 64% uh, um, of the 133 mostly widely used software components that everyone relies on are in a very critical shape and only maintained by a handful of people, can be two, can be three. They are doing this, um, nobody notices, most people don't notice. Um, it's a community of very intrinsically motivated people. Um, some of them work for companies, but most of them do this critical work in their free time. So what we need to do is to develop a more holistic approach when we talk about uh, DPI, in a way that we need to secure the foundations, innovate and maintain. It needs to be the whole life cycle. Um, I think people in this room know about this, um, but because this work is also very, um, not very thankful, it's a little bit like the road you take every day to work. You don't think about that road until it's blocked or broken and there's long maintenance work and then you're really annoyed. But if it's just working, it's just there. And then that's the same for, for the layer, uh, the, the focus of the Sovereign Tech Fund. And so if that's not working, all the great missions we heard just about are also not, not working. Um, so that is, that is my, my short pitch. Um, I'm really looking forward, if we're opening up um, the room for the discussion, 
because it's a particular topic, uh, the production logic, we also heard about this, is different in this field. So I, I mentioned the intrinsic motivation of many people. Um, it's also a very old legacy, so to speak, and um, our whole like very successful global digital economy relies on this software running. The whole world relies on software, of open source software actually, running in the background, being maintained, being available. That's the reason, one of the key reasons why we're innovative, why we have competition, why we have startups and SMEs. So it's uh, a really important topic for civil society, for governments and for companies uh, worldwide. And if we manage to have this holistic approach, I think um, that's gonna really get us far and also secure uh, us, everyone, in a position to act in the future. Um, because if the, if the roots are not well maintained, then the growth will not be long lasting. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, you're absolutely right. We need to stretch the definition of DPI because when we talk about infrastructure, the mentality is, is it hardware, just hardware, but it's not. It's also software. And as you rightly mentioned, the entire economy relies on these softwares. So um, yeah, we should include software as well in the definition when we talk about DPIs. Um, we now move online and I would request Valeria to kindly respond to this question. Yes, good afternoon, dear colleagues. So I would like to echo, um, in some ways, uh, the previous speakers. Uh, well, we believe in golden triangle of relations, government, private sector, and civil society. But we think it's not about building the ecosystem. It's about, first of all, creating conditions that enable all participants to work efficiently. So instead of discussing the ecosystem stakeholders, which are, to my mind, more or less similar in all of the countries, I would like to concentrate on several concrete examples which we have in Ukraine. So just for the content, uh, for the context, uh, in Ukraine, we have our state super app DIA, which is used by 19.5 million of users with digital documents, digital services, and digital signature. And even before the full-scale Russian invasion to Ukraine, Ukrainians already have been able to pay fines, to pay taxes through DIA, or to use DIA for digital documents. But DIA is not only about digital documents and online government services. We are also digitizing the workflow of both public and private sectors. We use such features as document sharing, validation, and DIA signature to speed up document flow and customer service and replace paperwork with digital and intuitive services that reduce costs and save time. So let's say some organization can receive electronic copies of digital documents of DA users using a sharing scenario. Through validation, companies can check the digital document validity just in two clicks, for example, in stores, post offices, or governmental institutions. So just in, in, as an example, the financial sector in Ukraine is one of many industries that most actively uses DIA services. 59 banks have already integrated sharing and DIA signature into their processes. This allows them to conduct quick customer identification and verification, open a bank account without visiting a physical branch, verify a customer when working with payment terminals, etc. So one of the most popular banks in Ukraine, Monobank, registers customers using a sharing scenario. And the record registration for this is 99 seconds. Also, one of the banks had around uh, 80K open bank accounts per day because of basically uh, the possibility of DIA signature opening bank accounts online. Another great example is our project DIA Education, which is a national edutainment platform uh, for reskilling and digital literacy, and the majority of content is created together with private sector or civil society. And that's really great because that helps us to, um, you know, um, I would say uh, enable our citizens with uh, new knowledge and expertise, which is really needed on the market. Another great example is our partnership with um, private sector. Uh, so when the full scale Russian invasion started, we have been able to create fast an app, which is called Air Alert uh, or Air Alarm uh, that sends uh, alerts about um, missile attacks. 
Um, and we have basically a lot of other examples where government is communicating and working really efficiently with private sector uh, companies, with startups, with civil society. We have this fast track of communication uh, and uh, we think that that's exactly the way how uh, modern governments should operate. They should be working like IT companies more they should be more agile and flexible. So what we are doing here in Ukraine, we are basically changing with such solutions as DIA, the way how government communicates with the citizens. So with that, DIA really became a love mark for Ukrainian citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria. Uh, we now open the floor for questions. We would take one or two questions if anyone in the room has any questions to the panelists. Uh, otherwise, we can move it to the end of this discussion. Um, all right. So moving to the next round. Um, thank you, everyone. And in the next round, we basically look at uh, what role does international cooperation have in this uh, ecosystem? So con considering that diverse approaches have been undertaken to implement DPI, it's still an evolving concept. Um, and there is still so much we don't know. Uh, so much we need to do and uh, we also see a lot of countries are struggling to implement DPI because of limited technical capabilities and financial resources. So my question to all speakers is what lessons did you learn in implementing DPI in your country and how can international cooperation leverage be leveraged to build interoperable inclusive DPI that empowers people? Uh, I would first request Mark to respond to this. Thank you. Th thanks for the question. Um, so I'll begin by s by agreeing with with what what has been said by Valeria about um, governance. So that is very important. Um, so we've so in Kenya we have this platform, a citizen, that has been in use. But then it's it's beginning to come under, you know, under not scrutiny. It's beginning to be tested its limits, and part of it is because there are governance issues that cannot be solved by technology, and there are technology issues that cannot be solved by governance necessarily. And I think on the governance side, um, there is need to to look at it a little bit more critically. In what ways? So, for example. Um, how how do we have a very robust infrastructure to deliver these services, and how do we begin to look at a community around it? So that's one. As a funder, um, and those who are in the room, we have to think about um, this in a in a longer term view than we do right now, because a lot of times there is there is pressure to to show results. Sometimes we don't want to accept we are failing, <laughs> but it is important to show, to, to, to think a bit about it in a little bit of a longer term view. Because if you're talking about governance and governance of data, so what does it mean now? Yes, it's very convenient that uh, at the proverbial click of a button, I can log in and do something in five minutes, but data has been shared across multiple agencies without me being aware. What does that mean? And what does that mean when, um, when I'm aggrieved, when I want to complain? So we have to think about that and that takes time. Then number two, we also have to think about the technology and the economics of the technology um, because there's, a, there's something for government when they say we want to lower the total cost of ownership of this technology. We want, don't want to pay recurrent licenses because we cannot afford, and that is valid. Um, so do they have the skills to procure digital public goods? So that's another, another consideration, just building that capability, and then that takes time. So as funders, are we looking at that and looking at that? Do we understand it even as we, as, we, as we speak to it? And then I think lastly, I will just mention that um, we have to, to create maybe funding instruments that like look, look 
look at it and, and maybe collaborate with others so that we, we look at it as we are putting the foundation of a house. When you're putting the foundation of a house, and I'm speaking about Kenya now, um, you sink a lot of money in the ground <laughs> and you do not see results. But once you kind of get the foundation is done, then you can have a lot of progress when you're constructing and, and people will come around and see something. But for a long time, you're just under the ground, like just putting in money and people could not see what you're trying to do. But then if you have a longer term view, then you have a robust infrastructure that maybe continues to be relevant even when some of the technologies become uh, obsolete in seven to eight years. But those tools are still in use. Thank you, Mark. Um, I, I think we all agree that there is a need for long-term planning because these technologies are fast changing. And the, as government, as private sector, and even communities, we need to keep up pace with these dynamic technologies. Um, thank you, Mark. I would now request Valeria to uh, respond to the question, what, how do you think international cooperation can be leveraged to build interoperable DPI? Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, so first of all, it's important to say that all governments are facing the same challenges, especially when it comes to digital transformation. So it's again, digital services, digital literature, uh, literacy, interoperability, cybersecurity, now AI and, and many, many others. And uh, there is absolutely no need to waste a lot of time in order to find the solution to some problems if, there, if the solution already exists and operates efficiently. So, uh, and it's not, it's not just about uh, the concrete technical products uh, or technical solutions. Like for example, in Ukraine, we are learning a lot from Estonia. Estonia has been our mentor in digital transformation. We are using a lot of Estonian GovTech products, including X-Road for interoperability which in Ukraine is called Trambita. But now uh, with our DIA uh, and DIA ecosystem, we uh, also have a lot of achievements and we are ready to share our experience with the world. So what I'm trying to say is that the world should be more aligned when it comes to the questions of digital transformation and understand all the um, existing solutions in order not to waste and to optimize time and to use those. Um, and also, it's not about uh, just products, not about just solutions. It's also about the uh, experience in some soft uh, questions. For example, uh, in Ukraine, in 2020, we have created a new position in the Ukrainian government, which is called CDTO, Chief Digital Transformation Officer. So these people operate on the level of deputy ministers or deputy governors. And they. Uh, and for today, we have CDTOs in every ministry, in every uh, governmental agency and in the regional councils. So that basically gives us a possibility to move fast with all digital reforms in different spheres and on different levels. And we know that uh, when it comes to such kind of organizational structure that uh, in other governments, in other countries, um, the organizational structure is, uh, I would say, slightly different, right? But uh, what we see is that especially these organizational structure was one of our success uh, cases, which helped us to make a huge leap in digital transformation just in three years. And um, if we would have a good platform for a communication between government, civil society, private sector, where we could share not just products, which obviously could be open sourced or not, but also could share a such kind of experience, I think um, that th this is this is uh, something uh, important at least to uh, elaborate on. Um, also, uh, there is no uh, great, I would say, um, academic or non-academic programs which really prepare people to become chief digital transformation officers for their governments. So there are some high level strategy or leadership courses, but when it comes to, you know, um, some concrete, um, finding some concrete solutions, I think uh, the new world-class uh, education for uh, digital leaders from all over the world, which will give not just knowledge and expertise, but also the possibility of a regular, um, unofficial even networking uh, would uh, improve 
uh, a lot and give a lot of new possibilities. So, of course, we can speak in this panel and in this question a lot about, you know, interoperability, lots of different technical solutions. But I believe uh, this information is more or less available on the web. And um, that's why I think my main message here is that we have to focus more on communication, on networking, on finding more points for cooperation between our countries and different institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria. I think uh, all governments need to make drastic institutional changes, create positions like the digital transformation officer that Valeria mentioned, because these people can reach out to the citizens, build the cap capacities, and also ensure that each citizen uses these digital services. Uh, thank you, Valeria. I would next ask uh, Adriana to respond. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I agree also with what has been said. I um, think it's important to stress that we need to be in a position where we can do the sharing and learning together. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Sometimes it's good to have similar um, tools uh, running at the same time and test which one works better and then you know, plug and play a, a little bit. Um, so it, it's necessary, I think, to stress that, um, yeah, public money, public code uh, has been heard before, I guess, but you need to be able to share, adapt, and change software that is around if you really want to push it to the maximum, this learning and sharing approach. Coming back to um, the focus uh, of the Sovereign Tech Fund, those digital um, base technologies, um, it's a bit different because maybe you do want redundancy. You want to have two or three things that do the same job running at the same time because coming back to the road analogy, if you only have that one road that is then blocked that one day, what are you going to do? So it's maybe less about uh, finding that one solution, share it, adapt it to your specific needs. Um, it's maybe about deliberately seeing where we need redundancy and how to maintain it. And uh, coming back to, to the uh, international cooperation, this is a global uh, digital common. Um, there are no geographic boundaries around those parts of the software that, that we're talking about. Um, they're used in all different kinds of contexts everywhere. So it is like particularly important to be well coordinated here. Because what could happen is that with all the good intentions that we have is ripping this ecosystem of the very foundations that we all rely on uh, apart. Because you're not coordinated. You're pushing and pulling in different directions. Uh, you can also not fix it by just throwing money at it. There needs to be a strategy. There needs to be community that advises you. There needs to be engagement from the private and the public sector. So if we're not doing it together, it's not going to work. Um, so it's, it's not a nice to have. It's a real must have to be well coordinated and understand that uh, for this digital public common, uh, we need to fix also the tragedy of the commons. Because I think right now what we have is everyone relies on it, but nobody feels responsible for it. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> this, this is, I think, our exercise for everyone to, to analyze this, to then come up with solutions, and then sit down together and really implement that. And not, not do it in, all our, in our little boxes, uh, but really from the very like day one, do it together. Thanks. Um, I would now request Pramod uh, Varma to respond to the question. Yeah, I think um, many of these uh, best practices and learning uh, have been actually shared quite widely uh, and it's available on various papers, um, you know, writings and talks. But I'll give you maybe um, three different parts of our, at least the learning we went through. One, when you build deep PIs, uh, at least for us, we were looking at uh, just one component of that that allows a lot more innovation to happen. That's why I keep using the GPS analogy. Uh, it is not about thinking through the whole solutions. We are letting the market and uh, society and other parts of the government and so on to put together solutions later. So for others to build solutions, what do we need to build? And that was a real question we were asking. So hence, uh, 
Uh, minimalism was a big principle that we kept playing out. If you look at our identity project or a payment project uh, or credential sharing, and like in you know Ukraine, the paperless uh, DIAs, the paperless uh, workflows. Uh, we wouldn't build the workflows, but we build the credentialing infrastructure that allows many, many workflows to be built. So minimalism was very, very essential. Interoperability, of course, uh, decentralization. And India is very, uh, India is very, what do you call, uh, diverse. And we have the federal hierarchy between the center and the states and quite a lot of autonomy uh, spread across many uh, different parts of the system. So centralizing as an architecture or design never works out. Uh, it never gets implemented well. It's also good for privacy. So decentralization as a design principle is very key. And of course, thinking through privacy and cybersecurity for any digitization is very key. This is one of the technology principles. But on the governance, I think very good uh, comments were made in the panel. Uh, policy interventions are necessary. Creating a participatory governance especially if it, this, this highway or this road uh, is used by many, many people. Uh, how does the governance of the road itself work, right? Uh, because many people are going to depend on it. Market players and others are going to depend on it. So participatory governance, accountability, uh, dispute grievance resolution, uh, you know, our, my colleague talked about that, its importance thereof, because there, something will always go wrong. And if things go wrong, what are the process of addressing that wrong? is very, very key. Uh, and most importantly, resilience. I think the redundancy topic was key, resilience. And India is not one payment system. We have three or four payment systems that seem to do somewhat similar things. But this is actually a good thing because depending on the entire uh, system for one digital building block is key uh, because if you get attacked or down for some reason, the entire system can come down. So resilience and redundancy is very key. But one more learning, other learnings we had, non-technical, non-participate, non-governance learning is also regulatory, political, and so social, societal buy-in. Now, many of these DPIs touch, at least for India, most of them touch a billion people, and that requires significant buy-in from society, uh, political leadership, and uh, regulatory uh, leadership, and the most importantly, market incentive alignment. Market, why should they use the DPI? Or can they create a closed loop or a walled garden or monopoly? Uh, can they, they would always want to create those private solutions that are locking the users in, locking the country in. But what is their incentive in playing interoperability? Uh, so I think a lot more discussion that needs to be done to get those buying, especially if you're implementing at scale, whole country scale. And then it's very key to get the alignment. And on the global coordination, I mean, it's a no-brainer, frankly, uh, global coordination, because as you know, somebody mentioned, there's no border uh, to people's aspirations. Uh, people's aspirations don't, are not limited to borders, geographical borders. Uh, people want to go across the countries. They want to work across economic opportunities, uh, education opportunities, healthcare needs. People travel and go across. So it's, and in discussing interoperability and portability of my data and credentials so that I can continue to use as a citizen, I can continue to use my data instead of depending on large systems to coordinate is, is very key. And we saw that with vaccine certificate in the COVID time. Uh, it was essential that we allow people to move around with the vaccine certificate. So interoperability, sharing of learning, and I'll also add sharing of assets. I think most of the panels said our assets are now available as DPGs, so digital public goods, open source goods. I think sharing of assets of what we are building with others also help uh, accelerate this journey. Thank you. Thank you, Pramod. So if, do we have any questions from the chat? Also looking into the room, of course, if there are questions in the room, happy to take them as well. We have one microphone in the middle. Please line up. But um, thank you for lining up already. Um, as uh, Mr. Abdiaziz Ahmed uh, posed a question quite a while ago in the chat, uh, I would uh, read this out first. It goes towards Africa, and so I look to Mark. Uh, he might have a response on this. 
uh, question goes, how can we increase trust of citizens with their governments, especially when it comes to digital IDs in Africa? I go for it? Okay. So there's, there's probably four things. Um, part of it has been mentioned by, by the last speaker. So we have people, we have processes, we have um, the product that you want to sell, and then we have politics. And um, it's things that are taught in term when you're developing uh, IT solutions in terms of maturity models and, and managing change. So I think one of the solutions is we, we, we of course talk about the citizen at the center uh, or human-centered design. It might be challenging or difficult to do it with very many people, but I believe one of the things that can drive or stop these court cases, you know, you implement a system and people go to court to stop it, is just because uh, anchored in the process is like, how, how do we treat with my individual rights as data rights? And, and, and the citizen is often left out of, you know, public participation is, a, is, a, is an academic exercise. So I think having the regulations is good because it helps citizens to push back and use the instruments of the law, and that's a good thing. And I think then we are kind of testing the laws and seeing how best to to involve citizens in de defining or designing these solutions. And I think that might be part of the issue right now in, in, in just you know the low level of trust. Um, if I sign up today, how does it translate to a public service being delivered to me? And that connection between data and water or electricity is not direct but it's also because there's a trust deficit in the politics of how everything is done. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, I will not do what most moderators do and uh, kind of repeat the gist of what has been said because we were warned we only have a few minutes left and still many questions uh, in the chat and in the room and we take the first question from the floor. Please, Lea. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Lea Gimpel. I'm from the Digital Public Goods Alliance. And um, I really love that we speak uh, so much about sharing technologies and open source here in this session. Um, however, we work a lot with countries, right? And um, I think we discussed here already that it's not only about technology being available, it's also about the governance and in general an approach. CPI is an approach much more than technology. And what we hear a lot from countries is that they're afraid of making the same mistakes again that they did in the past. So what I mean by that is that um, we, uh, what we find is that there are coordination problems within governments, and there is turf wars, and people are not <coughs> working together on the same thing, right? And um, in that sense, I'm wondering how we can instill this DPI mindset, really, in people. So I'm very much with Pramut, we're saying it's about minimalism, it's about starting with a use case and building it in a way that others can plug into it. But how do we instill this DPI mindset in people apart from like champions such as Amado uh, here in the room, uh, who is a champion in his country, building an extra implementation, but we need more of those people, right? So how do we get the message across uh, with policymakers and leadership? Thank you. Thank you, Leah. I'm looking to the panel, who wants to take the question up? Yeah, please Do you want ahead. me to quickly oh. answer? Yeah. yeah. So um, I'll, I'll give some perspective on um, at least few things that we are trying. One, I think the minister mentioned about uh, G20 uh, uh, co coordination and discussion. So many of the countries came together uh, on a shared definition understanding of what dpi is it's just a vocabulary as you know everybody's been doing this but there's a common vocabulary that was created and common set of principles were laid out and it said this is important as the digital economy uh, develop gets developed in many many countries in the next 
10, 15 years and so on. So how do we help every country create their own digital rails that allow their own digital economy to get pushed? And you know, we talked about GovStack and many other efforts that are going on. So there are, multi, from the people perspective, uh, I think the journey has begun and many of those discussions are happening. But the one thing we, in addition, we are also doing is that there are DPI funds now, DPGA, of course, so continue to support sharing of assets via DPG ecosystem. And we also just started, I'm a co-chair at the Center for DPI. We just started a Center for DPI as a um, pro bono effort um, to, uh, you know, spread, create uh, DPI resident, uh, DPI fellows and DPI residents around the world. So we are creating proper training certification, both certification for policymakers and certification for actual implementers. They are, these are, uh, you know, sort of a boot campish, you know, things that you go through to actually build. So we are working with 21 countries, uh, at least for now, uh, to create their own DPI residence in their own country, because contexts are very different and everybody needs to think through their, their own context in their own country. So there are some efforts that are going on, but I think it will get, it needs to get accelerated. Uh, so maybe more panels like this, more efforts, events like this, more training and support systems like this can actually be useful to bring it, bring it together, bring a com common understanding together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pramod. Um, I think, Mark, you also wanted to react to the question, right? Yeah, very quickly. Um, so the issue of total cost of ownership, like during procurement, I was once in one of my previous roles, I was once in Malawi and um, a system had been put in place that was able to transmit some results to patients. Um, so when it was time now to hand over to government, they were like, do we, do we put in infrastructure like hospitals in bed or we pay for these SMSs? So from the start, there was a lack of understanding of uh, procurement and what it implies to put this tool, because how do you go back to the taxpayers and say, we bought SMSs? So I think it is important to, to consider what it means. So do we license at database at middleware or at application level, and what does it mean over the long term? So I'll just add that to, to the response that was given. Um, for government to try out without burning their fingers and being locked in and, and having to go back to parliament and say, we, we bought a license and it costs X amount of dollars and, and you know there is a problem with that. Thank you so much, Mark. We have another question on the floor. Thank you so much. My, my name is Ramanjit Singh Chima. I'm Senior International Counsel and Asia Pacific Policy Director with Access Now, the International Digital Rights Organization. And my first, uh, and it's a two-part question. So the first question and comment is to promote online. And then my second part is to the panel. The first one is to promote, and there's been a lot of discussion around digitization and learning from lessons from the past. So I'm just curious for this group, wouldn't it also be useful for the global community engaged in this conversation to learn from the Indian experience and mistakes, for example, having a digital identity project out that didn't have a legal framework, that did not account for data protection rights, that in fact disputed whether privacy was a fundamental right, but also most importantly, the very design concept, and I know you in particular, Pramod, have ex extensive experience in this around the design of the system, namely a centralized, cloud-based, cloud-stored biometric database. Would that be something that's good for other countries to adapt to learn from? And the second question, therefore, the second part of the question to the panel is given infrastructure has rights and governance concerns, what steps has the DPGA or this community around digital public goods taken to mitigate harms around digital identity misuse, exclusion? Specifically, have there been consultations with human rights groups or others around lessons from digital identity experiences in India, in Kenya, in the Philippines, and elsewhere? And how do human rights groups be baked into this consultative process? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I first look over to Pramod. Do you want to react? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's much of these learnings have been actually, again, documented. We don't have to, it's, it's especially with the identity story. It's actually 12 years, 13 years now into the system. Uh, it was done with full executive support, parliament approval, budgets, uh, all the regulations. 
uh, I agree. The law sh- could have been law could have been done earlier. So if countries now uh, starting today uh, should definitely look at uh, uh, f- a full legal support, especially for identity. Uh, identity is a sensitive topic uh, today, but unlike things like payment or anything else that will like, get laid about that. So, uh, but every country has their own journey and those journeys uh, uh, are in the context of the country. Uh, I think we did have uh, existing laws that supported that effort and sub- subsequently you know, laid the uh, special purpose law for the identity itself. The cloud conf- part is actually wrong. You are wrong about the cloud part because any unique attestation, any unique identity attestation necessitates uh, the uniqueness part of the you, you part of the uniqueness need to come and that requires most of the national ID project, um, even in Germany or anywhere else, uh, have an identity database uh, or social, or social uh, you know, uh, security or anything else. Uh, now, maybe in the future, uh, there might be technologies I'm not aware at this time that can actually re- re- do a uniqueness attestation uh, without, storing, uh, without storing the previous data. So that means there's some storage of data, but minimal. it has to be minimalist, it has to be secure. Uh, identity system in, never been breached by the way. Central system never been breached so far. Uh, they were obviously on the edges, uh, incorrect usages and data leaks that has happened, uh, unfortunately. But um, it is not the central story that actually worries me. It's the governance around it, security around it. But if the purpose necessitates uh, the storage of data, it needs to store and needs to store minimum set of data. So I think uh, that's fundamentally it's not an architectural issue at all. It's not a design issue. It's it's how every identity system would play out. Uh, of course, the question can be how is it protected, uh, how is it uh, used, or uh, how how do we make sure it's not misused and so on. So that's, these are important questions, and the, much of these learnings have been documented. So uh, I think countries will have their own context. 2020, 10, 2015, 2023 when you implement, or 2030 when you implement. Uh, new technologies can be leveraged to create, uh, uh, you know, uh, relook at some of these design constructs. Thank you. Thank you, Pramod. Um, I've already seen the sign that our time is up, unfortunately. There was a second part to the question, um, which uh, was about uh, which measures are being taken that digital public goods are actually secure and uh, protect the data of citizens. Is there a very brief reaction from the panel on this question? Also looking to Valeria and Pramod, no? Mark, please. So so there's preventative and there's curative measures. Of course, we run to the law <laughs> when it's curative. Um, but I think pre- preventative, there's work that's being done by, say, the Digital Public Goods Alliance. And, and they, they, they are coming up with, like, this, this, these are practices. These are good practices that we can, uh, um, we can adopt, and and we take them as principles. And the reason we do that is, um, uh, y- you are preempting an issue happening by just following this uh, set of, of of practices that have been done. So, I'd offer that as a response. But I think uh, Pramod really did talk about it. I'm just gonna say one sentence. I think it's gonna make like in general everyone safer if we understand that we need to support an open available and secure ecosystem of uh, digital infrastructure components because that's where a lot of security issues also arise so we should understand it as a public's job to invest with public money in that area as well thanks thank you for that statement um i know we are over time i would still take one very short very, very last question from the floor. Okay, hi. Um, I was going to frame this as a question, but I think I'll leave it as a comment and the panel can choose to react or not. Um, I was wondering if you'd think about taking a bottoms-up approach to the redressal mechanism to a lot of DBIs, right? We have seen in India that the failure rate of identity system can be really high, and that affects the public welfare delivery system to a lot of level, to, to a lot extent. So maybe thinking about providing the user with a choice if the digitization or the digital aspect of the verification mechanism does not work, they can go to a person who can 
help them out because you know we're also dealing with a low level of digital literacy here in a lot of countries. Um, so thinking about those redressal mechanisms particularly and then also giving the user a particular level of choice where they can deal with these systems in terms of failures would be interesting. And I wanted to know what DPIs in, um, in your respective areas are doing around this, but um, I guess you can choose to react. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any spontaneous, very short reaction? Yes, Valeria, please. Yeah, my, oh, yeah thank you for the, for the question. Uh, so obviously, <laughs> um, when it comes to digital transformation, it's important to see everything as a one system. In Ukraine, for example, we have uh, projects which are working simultaneously. For example, we have a national program on the development of digital literacy. So everyone who would like to uh, increase their knowledge of digital literacy, they could do it either online or offline in a special digital centers where there is a gadget and internet connection and a facilitator who can facilitate the first contact between a person and a gadget or the platform. But when it comes, for example, to digital identity and to DIA app, which is our state's super app and which has 14 digital documents, and I would use this opportunity to remind that Ukraine is the first country in the world where digital passports are totally equivalent to paper or plastic ones. Uh, so, for example, DIA does not store any personal data. DIA uses the approach data in transit and connects directly to the high secured state registers and, and shares uh, basically uh, shows this, this data. So, uh, that's a really good question, but um, probably there is no uh, short and easy answer to that. Uh, when it comes to digital transformation in government or in country, to my mind, the most important thing is the vision. In Ukraine, we are building the most convenient digital country in the world. Uh, that's why we have created user-centric and human-centric services and products. And when there is a need to create something new or a service, product, whatever, we ask ourselves whether this really brings us closer to our vision, to the most convenient digital country in the world. It's impossible to build it if you don't have... Uh, if you have a basic level of digital literacy in your country. So it means that you have a, to do a lot of measures in this regard. It's impossible to build uh, the most convenient digital co country if you will not have um, digital services which are available for everyone and which are inclusive. It's impossible to build digital country if you will not have uh, you know, a digital economy which is working. It's impossible if government will not have a specific person who will be resp responsible for digital transformation in their own sphere and in their level, like national level or regional level. So the really great question, but I think uh, it's a topic for probably separate discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I would quickly summarize the entire discussion for our audience. So sorry to keep you waiting. And then, um, so in this discussion, the large, largely we need to understand what do we mean by DPI. And when we look at this concept, we need a holistic approach, not just include the hardware, but also the software, because again, there are no bounties. Um, we also need to look at the demand side. We need to see what the community needs and how they can participate in ensuring that these DPIs are built that are safe and are user centric. Uh, from the government side, we need to make drastic institutional changes, have uh, data officers who are responsible for ensuring that the citizens are using these services and their grievance redressal is in place. Um, so just a quick summary here and thank you so much to the audience and our speakers, especially to Pramod who's woken up so early in the morning for us. Um, thank you so much. And thank you, Rina, for joining us in this discussion.